The Lord be with you. Well, welcome everybody. Glad you could make it tonight. Um, if you would like to have notes that are basically my notes um, in advance, there's notes uh, as you came in. Uh, you don't need to write anything down. I pretty much gave you everything that, that I'm going to be working off of. And it's right on the chair there. Um, tonight, we are moving on to the second of six cycles as I have outlined it. Like I said, Pastor Cross and I are coming at this from uh, different perspectives. It's part of the overall um, message of Revelation, but there's so much there and there's so much you can dig into because really Revelation summarizes um, pretty much all of Scripture that John would have had at that time, which is the Old Testament, right? With the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, being the fulfillment of that. And so, um, what I am focusing on, though, are these six cycles to um, get a sense of how Revelation moves. And the, la- the first cycle that we covered had to do with the seven churches in Asia Minor. Chapters four through seven have to do with the seven seals. Maybe you've heard of the seven seals. Maybe you've heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's what we're getting into tonight, uh, depending on how far we get. This is the cycle that we are in. So, Um, I invite you to please uh, fold your hands with me and let's pray and then we'll get going. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would um, show the one who is worthy to open the scroll which is your will, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And um, give us revelation this evening, Lord, to better understand the good news that you have for us through the victory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, so I am wondering if anyone wants to volunteer for a nice long reading. Oh, you Lutherans. Half the rows back and no one raising their hand. Would anyone read chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 of Revelation for us? Dwayne, would you read it, please? Thank you. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of a jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you they will exist. By your will they existed and were created. Thank you very much, Dwayne. So John enters into the halls of heaven. As I mentioned, each of these cycles is like a roller coaster loop-de-loop. And the beginning and end of them, each are, um, they begin and end in the presence of God. 
So when things get really bad, because it is a judgment that brings basically destruction to all things, it's the end of all things, you're whisked back up into the presence of God, okay? So it's always good to have in the back of your head the hallelujah chorus, because if you get nervous about what you're reading, at least you know where you're going. In the first cycle, Jesus begins to speak to the seven churches, and we hear about three categories that the churches fall into that are different issues of persecution from the world. The first one is assimilation to the culture or, or accommodating to the wider culture. Uh, the worst problem in the loop-de-loop -loop is the problem of persecution, outright persecution, being attacked for being a Christian. But really, the biggest danger is, is complacency because then the threat doesn't come from the world. It comes from God himself, and Jesus speaks about that. But by the end of the cycle, we enter into what Dwayne just read, which is the presence of the sovereign God in heaven. Um, so John enters the halls of heaven where God presides over a celestial court. The court is made up of four living creatures with four heads, six wings, and several eyes praising God in loud song. Also surrounding the throne are 24 regal figures who join in the song of praise and throw their crowns at the feet of God. Now God is at the center of this vision, although his presence eludes us. We don't get to see God. Uh, there is power and mystery here. John respects the differences between human and divine. God is not just a big human. If you think about the culture at the time, which was uh, Greco-Roman, the primary gods that were worshipped, first by the Greek culture and then by their, um, the ones who conquered them, the Romans, were the 12 Olympians. And they were really pictured, and even if you read the old myths, um, they're, they're basically fickle humans. Uh, they have the same wants, needs, and desires as humans, but they have a lot of power behind them. That's not the same with the God of the Bible. Uh, God is mysterious, God is all-knowing, all-seeing, um, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all-powerful. His ways are not our ways, and in Scripture, God is not made out to be just a big human. So it's important to keep in mind, what's happening here is, is something that is beyond understanding to our human brains, this vision of God's heavenly court. The throne room makes clear that the proper order of things in the world is creation worshiping the creator. Humans are not at the center even if we would like to be. So if you think the way things should be, the right relationship with God is really recognizing that God is God and you are not. Now some people can fall into despair because they, they, they recognize that God is greater than them, but they think that God is against them. The proper relationship is to recognize that you are the good creation God intended you to be and not a God wannabe trying to have your own way. And so faith is getting reoriented. It's what justification means. We're justified. Anyone ever use a computer? No? Well, I'll tell you how it works. So when you're writing something on like a Word document or, or typing something up, there are little buttons that you can push to adjust your margins and you can be justified left or justified right. That means that, that it's all lined up to one side or the other. Well, this is what it means to be in a right relationship with God, to recognize that God is God, that you are not, that God is the creator, you are the good creation, and the response is to be in relationship to God, and that that relationship influences how you engage the world. So basically, what we're getting is a picture of God's will being done in heaven, the question of Revelation is, how is God's will going to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Now, some of the imagery is oldies but goodies. Remember, Revelation never quotes the Old Testament directly, but John gives all kinds of allusions all through it. And the first one comes from, this is working, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10, speaking of the four living creatures. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. And then in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, we hear, above him stood the seraphim, or, or um, 
We don't really know what seraphim is, but it's, it, tradition has said it's, it's a host of angels. It's, a, it's like a rank. There's different ranks of angels. And seraphim were pretty high up in the, in the orders of the angels. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. What was the point of the covering? It had to do with being in the, in the, in the presence of, of the God who is alone is awesome. And so they're covering their face and they're covering their body uh, for the sake of modesty and out of respect. The four living creatures represent all of creation, okay? They voice one of the true facets of God, that God is holy in 4, chapter 8. To be holy means to be set apart. It's kind of funny that when people say unholy as if that's a scary thing, you, you, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you hear like, like, remember rock stars in the 80s and 90s that would try to be scary? Uh, and they would, they, you know, they, they look so unholy. Unholy means to be normal, uh, literally. It, it means to not be set apart. It means to be plain Jane. Um, no offense to anyone named Jane. Uh, but it's not the opposite of holy. Holy is untouchable. Whereas, or, or holy is untouchable. Unholy means to be touchable. It's just like anything else. Um, but that's who God is according to the four living creatures. But notice what they don't add in their praise of God. And this holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. For those of you who remember liturgy, does anyone remember like the Lutheran liturgy in the green hymnal? Did you ever hear this phrase before? Oh yeah, Lutherans worship God through the expression of revelation. So anytime you had Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper, this is part of the order of service for Holy Communion. Uh, the Holy, Holy, Holy. Okay? But they, add, they leave something out. What they leave out is the Amen. And they won't add the Amen in Revelation until every creature also gives praise to God at the end of this cycle. Okay, so something is coming, and amen is coming. Or if you want to be really literal, in, in Hebrew it's amen. It's coming at the end. Okay? Now, Revelation 4.4, 4, it says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. The next ring of persons in the heavenly courtroom is the 24 elders, Now, interpreters of the text have argued that the elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. However, notice John just calls them elders, leaving their identity fairly ambiguous. In the New Testament, the word elder is presbyteros. It's where um, uh, we get the term Presbyterian. That church is using that, that term. And it refers to the leaders in the Christian church. Acts 14, verse 23, Titus chapter 1, verse 5. The readers of the seven churches are also given a clue to their identity. Remember earlier in this first cycle, Jesus had said to them that those who continue in faith will be wearing white robes, chapter 3, verse 5, given crowns in chapter 2, and given a place on Christ's throne in chapter 3. The conclusion is that those who continue in faith will be given a place of honor in God's presence. Revelation 4, verses 10 through 11, that were read to us, says this. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The elders do not have their own authority, but recognize that all they have comes from God, and they prostrate themselves before the Lord. Again, this is the proper relationship between the creator and the creation. It's to be constantly in worship. Now, it doesn't mean in heaven that it's just they're bowing down all the time. Uh, It's a vision showing the proper relationship between God and his people. 
As the living creatures represent all the creator worshiping God, here too the elders add to this song of praise and confession of the truth. John uses the imagery of the throne to undercut false hopes of humanly power. Remember, I mentioned um, just a few moments ago, the gods as the powers that be at the time that Revelation was written saw worldly power as reflecting the throne room on Mount Olympus of the 12 Olympians. And they were 12 equal thrones, but then there was one that was more equal, and that was Zeus. Okay? And the throne room of the emperor would have the emperor at the, ce- at the center, and any of his conciliaries or, or follow-alongs would, would sit on lesser places of prestige within his court. What John is showing is that all of that is fickle in comparison to the one true God and what God's heavenly throne room is truly majestic compared to a worldly power. It was not uncommon for rulers in Rome to be titled Lord and God. Um, Caesar Augustus was deified. Julius Caesar was deified. Caesar Tiberius was deified. Uh, Many of the emperors were worshipped as gods on earth. I think Caligula wanted to be known as uh, the new Apollo, the god of the sun. Uh, The emperor would be called Lord and God and would travel with an entourage who constantly sang their praises. Uh, With verse 11, John makes clear that all human displays of power and authority pale next to the true Lord and God. The thrones also set the stage as our leaving point to see how evil enters into all aspects of life to usurp worship of God and to do violence to the faithful, like Antipas, who was mentioned mentioned in one of the churches, who was uh, uh, one of the persecuted churches who who had been martyred for the faith. He'd been killed. Um, The throne of God remains the true seat of power throughout all of Revelation, It's where we're going to end up at the end of the six cycles. Every time we end up back in the presence of the throne of God, where there is safety rather than destruction. Those who were persecuted would be... um, Well, how would the, the early churches have understood this vision of the heavenly throne room? You can think of those three categories. The persecuted would have been comforted that the power truly lies with God and not with their accusers, those who were putting them in jail, putting them to death, uh, all kinds of stuff, outright persecution. The second group, the assimilated, or those who accommodated to pagan culture, would feel uneasy, for if God truly does reign, then assimilating or accommodating for the sake of economic and social ease would warrant the admonition given in chapter 2 by Jesus. And then the third group, the complacent, would probably find the image disturbing, since compared to God, their pride and wealth is shown to be a deception. No matter the response to the heavenly court, it is given to attract all types to join the singing praise to the Lord. Now next... In chapter 5, keep in mind that the four living creatures, in other words, the representatives of all of creation, the angels and everything else, all the way down to the little itty-bitty animals, and the saints, the 24 elders, speak of God as being worthy. But this question is raised. I need another volunteer who will read for us chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, other than Duane. Pat, would you read it, please? Then I saw a right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open scroll and to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. 
and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood ransomed the people of God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them the kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne of the living creatures, and the elders, of the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that was in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Did you catch the Amen? Yeah. Something is happening here. God's will is about to be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. So, oops. So John's eyes are directed toward the right hand of God, which holds a scroll with seven seals. Now, a sealed scroll in John's time was a document of authority. The seal was placed upon the scroll with a mark of the one who sent it. Strangely, this scroll holds seven seals that disclose things God has not revealed to the world yet. We have learned that all of creation gives its allegiance to God. However, this is, done, this is not done on earth. So how will God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Revelation 5, 2 through 4. I'm going to repeat the writing. It says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of, Ju of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Earlier it said, God is worthy. And all of creation is judged, basically, by God. And no one, no one in all of creation, any of the creation, is found to be worthy. Now, what we're going to find is that Jesus is not just one of the creation. That's kind of the main point of Revelation. You're going to notice that when Jesus is spoken of, it's always in relation to God and God's glory. So what God has, Jesus has. What Jesus has, God has. This is an old doctrine in the church known as communicatio idiomatum. Repeat. Communicatio Idiomatum. Yeah, I know you can impress your friends. It means the communication of attributes. In other words, what Jesus does, God does. What God does, Jesus does. When you look at your Bible, the Old Testament, when God is speaking, Jesus is speaking because he is the Word. And he's the Word from the beginning. And through the Word, all of creation was brought about. There is no separation between God and and Jesus. Now, there are three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. The Spirit is not the Father. And yet, all are God. Now, think about what this means. Communicatio idiomata means that what Jesus does, God does. So when Jesus is born, guess what? God is born. When Jesus, as a baby, Nurses, God nurses. When he poops his pants, God poops his pants. As a kid, when he scraped his knee, God scraped his knee. And when Jesus forgives sins, 
God forgives sins. And when Jesus died, God died. That's what that means. And that's what Revelation is bringing forward. That the Lamb is worthy because He is God. Okay? An angel announces who is worthy. A search is made. This shows another difference between God and creation. Creation cannot carry out the will of God. Again, God is God. We are not. That's what it means to be the good creation when we recognize that. In verses 5 and 6 it says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In this vision, John creates a difference between what he hears and what he sees. When you read through Revelation, Be very careful to look for those things. When people miss the hearing and the seeing, that's when they come up with all kinds of interpretations of what this stuff means. John is going, uh, throughout the cycle, he's going to compare what he has heard of what is to come and then what he sees as it's played out. And what he sees is always much grander than what he originally heard. And this is, a good way to understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Much of what we hear in the Old Testament, the expectation is different than how it actually comes about in the New Testament, through the Messiah, through Jesus, and what that then means for all of creation. In the New Testament, the promises that God gives in the Old Testament are expanded beyond anyone's expectations. No one in the Old Testament... During the New Testament times, none of the Jews thought that the Gentiles would be reconciled to God. didn't work that way. They had to become Jewish first. But that's the message of the New Testament. Uh, It's for all people. It's the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Well, I will write a new word. uh, I will make a new covenant with them. I will write my word on their hearts. They will know me. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Whereas the relationship with God is based on forgiveness of sins rather than on the keeping of the law. Rather, the keeping of the law does not get you into heaven. It's set as a boundary to protect and sustain life so that we can be the good creation we were meant to be rather than trying to earn our way into heaven. Our relationship with God happens through forgiveness. That's the New Testament. Okay, so... In verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 5, John hears that the Lion of Judah is coming. He is the one who has conquered, that's that word Nike again, and able to open the seven seals. He hears it. He doesn't see it. He hears it. Look at um, uh, Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10. That's the first book in your Bible if you want to follow along. We're going to go there. This is what it says. Now, um, this is near the end of, of uh, Genesis. If you know the story of, of Joseph and his uh, uh, mini colored coat, uh, technicolor dream coat or long sleeved coat, however you want to translate that. This is after all of that. They're in Egypt. Jacob and the entire tribe, uh, his, all of his sons, have reconciled with Joseph. And Jacob blesses. The sons of Israel, uh, he's also Israel, um, and this is what he says about Judah. It says, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. That is a far-reaching prophecy. Um, That is a driving prophecy throughout the rest of Scripture, because it speaks about the lineage, but also the the establishment of an eternal authority to the house of Judah. Judah is identified with the image of a lion, 
and is the tribe from whom kings come in the Old Testament. Here Jacob prophesies that the scepter will not depart from Judah. The imagery of the Messiah from Old Testament times was that he would be a conquering king like King David, who was from the tribe of Judah, who conquered his neighbors and established the kingdom of Israel. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, speaks of the one who would come from the line of David, who would subdue the wicked and bring wisdom to the earth. Now that's what John hears, because he knows his scripture. What he sees is something entirely different. He doesn't see a lion who conquers, but he sees a lamb who was slain. The images of the lion reflect the expectations of the Messiah, while the image of the lamb points to the crucified Christ as the revealed Messiah. The Messiah was expected to conquer, and yet Christ conquers the true enemies of this world, sin, death, and the devil through his death and resurrection. Psalm 132, 17 says, Then I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. And then Isaiah, if you want to turn with me to Isaiah, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. All right, 11, 1 through 3a, it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. The horn represents royalty. Notice it mentions this lamb that has seven horns, um, and seven, uh, seven eyes. The horn represents royalty like a crown, while the eye represents the spirit. You ever heard anyone say that, that the, the eye is the window to the soul? You ever heard that phrase before? That's an old phrase that goes all the way back to the Bible. Okay? Um, the lamb who was slain has seven horns and seven eyes. Why do you think that is? The number seven in Revelation is completion or perfection. And so Jesus has complete authority with seven horns. And eyes represent the Spirit. So Jesus has the complete Spirit of God. Okay? Um, He is complete royalty and completely filled with the Spirit. Now, verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 9 through 10 of Revelation. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. The Lamb's death does not look like Nike. Um, It looks like defeat. But through it, he brings persons of all nations and kingdoms to the heavenly throne. All glory given to God is now given to the Lamb. Those who proclaim God worthy of praise now claim the Lamb to be worthy. He does not usurp God's glory, but instead does the will, completes the will of the Lord by dying and rising. His death ransoms people for God who serve God as priests. In other words, the entire fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament in the Messiah through Jesus in a way that the world did not expect because God comes down and does it himself because no one else is worthy to do it because everyone else is a sinner and needs to be ransomed uh, from sin, death, and the devil. And now, chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, it says, Saying with a loud voice, 
Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Now I want you to count these off with me, okay? To receive one, power, two, wealth, three, wisdom, four, might, five, honor, six, glory, and seven, blessing. How many things does God deserve? Isn't that eerie? You think that's a, you think that's a coincidence? It's seven, okay? In other words, God deserves all the glory. The Lamb deserves all the glory. The song that earlier gave glory to God is now overcome with a myriad of angels who give all glory and power to the Lamb. He is not greater than God, but is praised alongside God, for through him the praises of heaven are extended to the world as well. As all of creation joins the song, the four living creatures add the Amen. This is God's will. Now, what's going to continue in Revelation is how this now um, impacts and brings to uh, a culmination on earth as well. Um, There was one more thing I wanted to point out. If you go back to verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So, the largest number in Hebrew is uh, the, the largest denomination is thousand, okay? So you can get like hundred thousand, but there's no number for million. So when in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew mind, if you wanted to say like 10 million, you would say like 10,000 thousands. Does that make sense? Or myriads and myriads is referring to, the, it's, it's millions of angels, Okay? And when you see thousands upon thousands, the number thousand means completion. Doubling it means like forever and ever. Complete, complete, complete. Um, and so when people look at these, these numbers in Revelation and try to come up with like, there's going to be 200 million soldiers that are going to invade Israel. We're going to find where they get that number because in Hebrew, there's no number for 200 million. Um, it, would, it, it's, it, it says like, like 200,000 thousands or something like that, Okay. That's how you get a number bigger than a thousand in uh, Revelation. Now, things are going to start getting spooky. We're going to our first cycle. The first six seals. Whenever a scroll was given that had a seal on it, you knew that it hadn't been tampered with as long as that seal was placed upon it. With this scroll, this is the will of God that has not been accomplished on earth yet. Jesus is worthy, the Lamb is worthy, to open the seals and therefore reveal the will of God. Um, As each seal is broken, crazy stuff starts to happen on earth. I need someone to read for us chapter 6, verses 1 through 17. Who's brave enough to get us into the four horsemen? Let me remind you that the very first couple verses of Revelation say, anyone who reads this writing is blessed. So I encourage anyone, you don't have to be a good reader, you just got to read. Les, would you do it, please? Thank you. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, the voice of the thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and a rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out of the country, and to comfort. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Now came another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that the people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When 
he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death and Hades. Hades followed him, and they were given up for a fourth year, and killed with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence by the well beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe to open the two best of the one, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun came black as sackcloth. The full moon came like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as the thin tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and the powerful, and everyone else, everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can save them? Excellent. Thank you. The purpose of the visions in chapter 6 is to make you uneasy. I'm telling you that in advance, because maybe you feel a little uneasy. I know I do whenever I read chapter 6 of Revelation. It brings a question, where do you put your trust? Where is your security? A common mistake when reading the vision of the four horsemen is, that, is to think that these are predictions of a future event. When you open your paper and see widespread war, you know that you are at the first event. Next will come anarchy, then economic hardship, and finally the end of the world. However, that is not the purpose of this vision. It is not a prediction, and it is not to be taken literally. In fact, no one takes it literally. They may take it as a future event, but no one thinks that there's going to be someone riding on a white horse with an arrow, and when you see that person, then the first seal has been broken. That everyone always thinks that's some, some other event. Um, everyone agrees on this. It is hard to pinpoint the horsemen on a timeline because what they bring has been with us all throughout history in John's time and in ours today. What the horsemen do is they shatter the illusion that we can find security in a nation or in our pocketbooks. When the reader responds as verse chapter 6, verse 17, where it says, Who will stand? They're ready to move forward to the next set of visions in chapter 7. This is how the images of the horsemen work. They slowly move in on us, with the least threatening being the farthest way to the most threatening, death, coming closest. Uh, a famous uh, Lutheran artist named Albrecht Durer has a wood cut out that shows this. A um, little homework for you. Go home and Google Albrecht Durer um, and Revelation or the Four Horsemen, and you'll see this wood cut out that, that I'm mentioning here. The first horseman is conquest. Um, it's often the furthest away from our daily worries. How many of you are worried that we're going to get invaded by the Taliban? That's the only group that I can think of that we're currently at war with, although that's coming to an end. How many of you are, are uh, uh, worried about being invaded by Russia or China, Iran? It might be a bit of a worry, but it's far away. It's not in our backyard. 
If the first horseman brings a sense of distant uneasiness, the second horseman brings it a step closer. How many of you are worried about violence in your own backyard? Someone breaking into your home, being mugged, um, riots in the streets. You know, I think of war, well, that's never going to come to little old North Dakota. But there's crime here too. In fact, uh, we had a, 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 what are they called, a, a catalytic converter stolen off of one of the vans. That's why we moved them. They were sitting up front for a bit. They're going to go into storage. They'll be fine. We're going to take care of them. But, you know, that's in Fargo, of all places? Yeah. It's closer to us and to our own sense, sense of security than invasion from a foreign power. Danger doesn't come just from soldiers from another country, but from criminals and violence right here in our own back land. The third horseman brings the threat even closer with, with economic troubles. Are you more concerned about crime, someone breaking into your home, or that you have enough money to pay your bills? What's on your mind more often? What area of security are you more concerned about? Foreign wars? Crime in our neighborhood? Your paycheck. The final horseman is death. This is the one we often ignore. In fact, um, we have a denial of death. It's a, it's a 20th century phenomenon that's carried over into the 21st century. We deny death. Uh, you think about 100 years ago when death would happen, you die in your home with your family around you or your friends around you, and then the prayer service or the wake would happen in your home. And then when it was time for burial, you would be brought by your family to the church and by the community, and then when the funeral was done, the entire church would take you to the cemetery, which was usually located behind the church, where you would be buried. Nowadays, when you get sick, you go to a hospital that's been sanitized and clean and and made to be very sterile, and when you... I should say if and when. We're all going to die. When death comes, your family would be around there, but then you are whisked into the basement of the hospital out of sight. And then from the hospital, you're transported to the funeral home. Your remains are transported to the funeral home where you're out of sight. And you're made to be presentable or you're cremated to remove any uneasiness about the reality of death. And then the funeral happens, and often it's a closed casket during the funeral. And then you're, you're whisked off by the funeral home to the place of burial for a committal, and, and that's it. And so the way that we deal with death has changed tremendously in the last hundred years where we are constantly denying it. Um, And this is just the reality of being human. Uh, We're all mortal. We're all going to die someday, but none of us want it to be today. Uh, And we will deny it till we're blue in the face, literally. So, the fourth horseman is the one that we'll all face that we all want to ignore and not think about. The imagery of the four horsemen have held our imagination over the centuries, but some details of the horsemen would have struck a personal chord with the seven churches. The first horseman is reminiscent with his bow of the Parthians. Now, the Parthians are the descendants of the Persians. Um, they were, that's the part of the ancient world where... Um, um, Daniel... Uh, would have been located, or the Magi. They would have been from Parthia, which was an empire. If you look at old maps, usually we just see Rome, but if you look just east of Rome, there's a whole other empire, and that's the Parthian Empire. And they were the biggest competitors with Rome. When um, Rome would work to bring about its peace, and the way that Rome brought about peace was with its primary doctrine of Nike, or victory, 
conquering your enemies in order to impose the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. As long as you uh, are cool with Rome and l- allow for uh, the roads to be built and the aqueducts to be set up, things will be great for you, but we're in charge and you're going to keep the economy going. Parthia would raid Rome with its horsemen, pillage and plunder the edges of Rome, and would consistently push back the legendary Roman legion. Whereas the Germans, who many of us are descended from, could not hold back the Roman legion, the Parthians could. Okay? So the first horsemen would have been exactly the image of the Parthians, the enemy that could overcome the Pax Romana. Chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Now, the second horseman takes away security within one's own borders as the first took away security outside one's borders. This undercut the constant propaganda tool of Rome. Again, the Pax Romana, or Roman peace. Rome argued that the world should be grateful for their authority and the peace that they gave. Therefore, such measures as oppression of Christians was seen as necessary to preserve the peace. Yet the second horseman warns that this peace is fleeting, and it's not a true peace. Chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, it says, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. Do we want to be in the red, or do we want to be in the black, financially speaking? Which one's better? You want to be in the black. So the one who controls the economy rides a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. Now the third horseman holds scales and represents economic hardship, recession, depression, stagflation. Rome was celebrated for being able to make grain affordable. Thus the roads and the aqueducts and the movement of goods across the empire. However, this vision makes clear that only a small bit would a denarius, a denarius was a day's wage, be able to buy. It was enough food that a family of a few people could survive, but it certainly wasn't anything that would bring you out of a a state of desperation. Also, crop shortages or droughts always affected the rate of the economy. In other words, there is no security for the seven churches in the Roman economy. Chapter 6, verse 8, it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. Um, How many of you know your Greco-Roman deities? How many of you have seen the Disney cartoon Hercules? Hades is the one with the flaming hair. So Hades was the Greco-Roman god of the underworld. The Romans called him Pluto. It's where we get the name for the planet. All the planets have some kind of Greco-Roman connection, as well as all of the names of the week have a Norse connection, and the months of the year have a Roman connection. Okay? More homework for you. Um, Hades is also where we get the word hell, because in Greek, it's the same thing. It's the, it's the place of the underworld. Now, if you ever wonder why the Olympian deities got the names that they had, if you go back, it, it's a study in etymology. If you go back to, to Old Akkadian, which is the language from which most of the um, Greco-Roman uh, romantic languages came from, They deified nature and the things that they saw. The name in Old Akkadian for the sky is, surprise, surprise, Zeus. And the name for 
the land of the dead where people go when they die was Hades. Over several hundred years, those names became deified by the descendants of the Akkadian language, which would be the Greeks and the Romans and so on. Okay? Just a little bit of etymological history there for you. So the word Hades here does not mean the Roman god. It's referring to the place of the dead. It's referring to hell, uh, as we say in the creed. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. He descended into hell. Okay? In, in the Greek, in the New Testament, in its original language, whenever you see the word hell, it's the word Hades. It's the same thing. Okay? Um, Hades follows behind him. It's the realm of the dead, or in Hebrew, it's called Sheol. Um, the understanding is different from hell and popular thought. When we think of hell, we make the mistake of thinking of it as in terms of Dante's Inferno, or like hell is the, the kingdom of the devil. That's not true at all. Um, death is something that is finally beyond our control. I'm going to give you a much scarier understanding of hell, okay? Some people will say that hell is the place where you're separated from God. I'm sorry, that's not true either. God is God, and God is not limited by anything in all of his creation, including hell. Hell is not um, just a fiery pit where the devil has his pitchfork and is red. The devil does not want to go to hell. That's the last place the devil wants to go. And in Revelation, we're going to read that it's prophesied that that's exactly where the devil's going to go. But here's a much scarier thought about hell. Hell is the place where God is not for you. God is actually against you. Just let that sink in for a minute. It's where the grace of God is no longer present for you. All that remains is the wrath of God. And the point that Revelation is making is that for those who conquer, what, conquering is having faith in the grace that God gives on account of Jesus Christ. And where there is faith in Jesus Christ, death has no final say over you. Your life, this life, or your eternal life. Without faith in Jesus Christ. Hell is the final destination. And even there, for the ungodly who want to be separate from God, as we're going to read about in Revelation, they don't even get their wish there. Because God is still present there. But God is there against, not for. Okay? Does that make sense? I find that much more scary, <laughs> personally. All right, so... We can get through this. Uh, where is God in all of this? Finally, we need to recognize that God is the authority which permits the damage of the four horsemen. Remember, God is not idle here. God is, is in control. In other words, God is a threat. John is not trying to explain why evil is in the world. This is, this is called, uh, this, the, thinking that way is what's called theophany trying to justify evil in the world in the face of a gracious God. John's not even messing with that. Um, he fears and loves God, knowing that God kills and makes alive, according to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. Yet the world is also where the devil operates, where Satan operates, and where human sin runs amok. Revelation sees threats from all three sources. Therefore, you cannot always know if the threat in Revelation comes from God, from Satan, or from other people. Instead of trying to explain away evil, John's vision calls the reader to proclamation. In other words, to confession, to, to confess that God is your Savior, your Deliverer, to lead to repentance, and ultimately to faith. Oops. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Apologize to anyone watching this online. I keep losing my spot. When he opened... Ooh, now we're moving. So that ends the cycle of the four horsemen. And now things are going to get worse. 
if that wasn't bad enough, right? Seals 5 and 6. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. These visions offer the question, do you want to rest with the martyrs in heaven or be disturbed by destruction on earth? There is no middle ground. Revelation doesn't allow you to have a middle ground. You're either with the lamb or you're with the beast. There is no wiggle. There is no Switzerland here. Um, Where do you stand? Where does your faith lie? In the limited and failing securities on earth or in God's glory in heaven? The images reverse earthly and heavenly perceptions. From the earthly view, faith seems to lead to suffering and loss. Thus, the warning to the complacent church. The conclusion would be that faith should be given up in pursuit of greater security right now. The visions reverse this thinking because ultimately the martyrs find rest and security in heaven while the world is a plain mess. By the time of Revelation's writing, there is evidence to support this historically. Besides Antipas mentioned in Revelation, Stephen had been killed as well as the apostle James in Acts chapter 7 and 12. Emperor Nero had already murdered several Christians in Rome by crucifixion, being torn apart by dogs, and being burned to death. Chapter 6, verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The martyrs give a cry that has been heard on the lips of the afflicted for generations. Zechariah chapter 1, Psalm 79, uh, give the same, same type, cry out to the Lord. How long? Some may be bothered by the martyrs' cries because they do not reflect Jesus' teaching of loving one's enemies, and yet the cry for justice cannot be dismissed. The martyrs did not suffer because of being sinners, but because of being faithful, for being Christians. One rightly asks, does God care? Does love turn the blind eye to the wicked, shedding the blood of the innocent? Is mercy and grace other names for indifference to sin, evil, and suffering? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The divine answer raises questions as well. The martyrs are given white robes, which signify purity, righteousness, celebration, and Nike, or victory. The gift shows that the martyrs are valued in God's eyes, even though the world rejected them. The strange news, however, comes that they are to remain at rest until the number of martyrs have joined them. The death of God's faithful serves God's purpose. Why do more Christians have to die? We're not given an answer here. Later in chapter 11, we will discover a purpose in this tragedy. I'm going to let you in on a little hint. Wherever the church militant or Christians have been under persecution throughout the history of the world, the gospel has exploded, creating faith in miraculous ways. Rome was overcome through the witness of of persecuted Christians by their faithfulness to God and their love for their neighbors. Some of the earliest Christians uh, became famous and spread the gospel during times of plague. 
where they were known to literally love on the, the, the pus-ridden uh, sick people when everyone else had fled the, the town and showed their love by literally sucking the pus out of their wounds, being pus suckers. Everything of that image of what Christian love looks like. But that is what overcame the most powerful empire in the world. The faithfulness of Christians to the gospel in the face of persecution. Verses 12 through 14, it says, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island were removed from its place. The opening of the sixth, sixth seal turns the moon to blood, the stars falling from the sky as the sky vanishes and the earth shaking. This vision reflects prophetic warnings in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, in Joel, in Amos. The creation is responding to the will of the Creator. This vision challenges the idea that one can find security in this world by compromising your faith. This vision contrasts the fifth vision of the martyrs who gave their lives for the faith and received eternal life. To compromise your faith puts you in danger not from the world, but from God. And now, verse 17, it says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Who is to stand? Who would expect the answer to be no one under the circumstances? But that is not the case. Chapter 7 shows that there are some who stand before God and the Lamb by grace alone. So, we're two, two uh, uh, pivots through our cycle. The last cycle will cover the um, curious question about the 144,000. And so... Um, Hope to see you. I don't think we're meeting next week because of VBS, but we'll meet, meet the following week. So I'm going to close this in prayer. We're over our time. Thank you for being patient and staying a little bit longer. I wanted to get through chapter 6. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the Lamb, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who will come again to judge the living and the dead. May we be filled with faith in you in the midst of all things. May our identity be wrapped up in your goodness, that we are made in the image of God. We are image bearers, marked with the cross of Christ, sealed with the Holy Spirit, made new by the blood of the Lamb. And may we join in singing your praises with all of the heavenly host, that you are holy, that you are worthy of praise and that the Lamb is worthy of praise, and that because of Him, we are victorious. May that strengthen us each and every day. And may we have eyes to see you in the midst of this world and not get wrapped up in the, the lies of sin, death, and the devil that would seek to take us away from your goodness. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.